The last time Boeing set about to create a new aircraft concept, the result was something called the Model 367-80. This aircraft led directly to Boeing's KC-135 tanker and then the Boeing 707, which quite literally shaped commercial aviation for over half a century. Now, is Boeing's next recently unveiled concept going to do the same for the 21st century? And are there any controversy around it? Stay tuned. All the way through the 737 MAX crisis and then the terrible year 2020, the entire aviation world had been trying to guess when Boeing was going to launch its next all-new aircraft design and what that design might look like. Now, Clearly, Boeing's finances have been strained a lot in different ways in the last few years. They had to handle not only the 737 MAX crisis, but also the certification of the 777X, the production issues with the 787, and to combine the 787 production into one single site. Boeing also ended the production of the 747, and they had to look for ways to replace thousands of their most experienced but now retiring engineers. So, in the beginning of 2020, even before we knew just how bad that year would be for everyone, Boeing's newly appointed CEO, David Calhoun, outlined the company's strategy for the coming month. Boeing would cancel their development plans for any new airplane designs, focus on getting the MAX back in the air, and then save money wherever they possibly could. Now, this plan must be working because late last year, Calhoun said that he was now much more optimistic about Boeing's future than when he took over in January 2020. But in the same press conference, he also said something that made a lot of industry insiders raise not only one, but probably both of their eyebrows. Boeing said that they won't even go to the drawing board this decade for its next aircraft design. That's quite a bold statement, and on the surface, it didn't make much sense, because yes, there is of course the CFM RICE project, which won't lead into a production engine before the middle of next decade, but why wouldn't Boeing use the time up until then to advance the design of the next aircraft? New engine technology and fuel options are still sitting quite far in the future for commercial aviation, and Boeing basically said that they're going to wait for these developments. But Engines are only a part of the answer when it comes to increasing efficiency. There are plenty of potential improvements that involve the rest of the aircraft structure as well. New lightweight materials are part of why newer aircraft are more efficient, but exploiting the properties of these new materials could lead to aircraft that will also look a lot different. And for a more complete understanding of what I mean with that, we have to talk a little bit more about the wings. If you look at the wing of an old Boeing 707 or a military KC-135 from a certain angle, it looks really simple and sleek. One reason why they look so clean is that those wings doesn't have those fairings in the rear that cover the flap rail mechanisms. Nearly all other commercial jets from the last four decades have some form of these flap track fairings or canoes as they're also often called. And that of course begs the question, how come the wings of the 707 and those of the similarly aged Douglas DC-8 actually manage without them? Well, the answer to that is that these simple sleek wings of the older designs were actually quite thick, rigid and by modern standards really heavy, so the fairings could actually be hidden inside of them. But Weight isn't the only problem here. A key characteristic of a wing that determines how efficient it will be is the aspect ratio, which is the ratio between its span to its cord. In other words, the ratio between how long a wing is compared to how wide it is. A wing with a very high aspect ratio will produce more lift with less drag or have a better lift to drag ratio. So in other words, to make a wing design more efficient, we need to give it a very large span and make it very narrow from the front to rear. And if you have seen pictures of modern gliders, you will see exactly what we're talking about. That's what we need to do this. So if we go back to the Boeing 707, we can clearly see that this is not a very high aspect ratio wing, relatively speaking. Of course, aircraft designers knew all about aspect ratios back then as well, but you have to remember how early all of this was. The Boeing 367-80, or the Dash 80, first flew back in 1954. The jet age and the high speeds it brought with it were still quite new back then, and on top of that, much of the knowledge about materials like aluminium alloys and their properties weren't really unlocked until the mid-1960s or even later than that. 
And of course, research organizations like NASA have a big role to play in those developments, but we'll get to that later. These new developments eventually brought us newer designs with longer, narrower and thinner wings. Composite materials also allowed engineers to design wings that flex as they hold the weight of the aircraft, permitting the design of the wing to get even lighter, thinner and longer, and with that, more efficient. The wing of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner is a fantastic example of that. So how do we go from that to this strange new design that Boeing and NASA just presented? Can't we just re-wing existing Boeing 737s and Airbus A320s to make them more efficient? Well, I'll tell you all about that after this short message from my sponsor who makes it possible for me to make these videos. Are you planning a trip? Well, in that case, today's sponsor NordVPN can help you to search for cheaper tickets, access your favorite content and protect your data while you're browsing on public Wi-Fi during your travels. Entering payments while using unsecured Wi-Fi can put your banking information at risk, even if the place looks quite safe, like an airport lounge, for example. NordVPN protects you against snoopers, malware and phishing websites while ensuring anonymity in payments by credit card and PayPal. And also, certain countries have created restrictions on video calls, which can be a real issue if you're traveling to work like I am. NordVPN will help you to access websites like Skype and WhatsApp just by changing your location with one click, which have been really helpful to me at times. The app will give you access to over 5,000 servers in 60 different countries, which gives you total online freedom. So if you go to nordvpn.com slash mentor now, right now, you'll get an exclusive two year deal plus one month absolutely free, so you don't have anything to lose. Go down, click the link, check it out. Thank you, NordVPN. Now let's continue. Despite new research and materials, fitting really long glider-like wings on an airliner is a real technical challenge. Gliders are by definition very, very light and airliners obviously are not that light. And even more to the point, fitting a new wing with substantially different dimensions and characteristics to an existing airliner can be a quite challenging, if not even possible job to do. The wings that just about every airliner are fitted with today use something called a cantilevered design. This means that the wing supports itself through its own structure. Internally, wings have one or more spars, which are essentially beams that run the length of the wing, and these spars then are bolted onto something called a wing box in the fuselage, which acts as an extension of the spars all the way through to the opposite wing. But many smaller aircraft, like the Cessna 172 or other similar designs, but also some bigger turboprops, use wings with struts supporting them from underneath. In these designs, the wing itself has a similar internal structure, but the strut under the wing actually carries a lot of the load. Here, only the section of the wing that comes after the strut is technically cantilevered. However, Cessnas and other aircraft that use this design generally have straight wings with no sweep towards the rear, so the loads traveling through the length of these wings are relatively simple and linear. Conversely, the loads affecting swept wings are much more complicated. This isn't really a factor for gliders that have cantilevered but unswept or straight wings. The same goes for turboprops like the Dash 8, for example, which has straight and relatively high aspect ratio wings. In practice, for an aircraft to cruise at the speeds that commercial jets use today, close to the speed of sound, it really needs swept wings. So, in its pursuit of a big leap in efficiency, NASA has been working on ways to fit wings with aspect ratios resembling those of gliders on an aircraft with swept wings that can travel at speeds up to max 0.8, the same range of speeds that we normally use today on modern jets. The concept that NASA and Boeing are now exploring is called the transonic truss brace wing and John Ostra were at the air current that I by the way highly recommend that you check out has analyzed it extensively. There's a link here in the description. As an idea, the transonic truss brace wing or the TTBW is really not that new. The design goes back more than a decade to when Boeing was exploring a concept that they called the Sugar Vault, which used a very almost identical wing setup. This aircraft would have had a hybridized propulsion system that would recover electrical energy to boost engine power in certain phases of flight. But this initial version had very little sweep on its wings and that meant that it would always be slower in cruise. Initially, the airframe was limited to speeds no higher than max 0.7 and with the hybrid turboprop propulsion system that they were initially planning, the aircraft would have been even slower than that. 
The Sugar Vault was really trying to test multiple disciplines all at once, but lately NASA instead started concentrating on optimizing the airframe and the wing itself. With more testing in multiple NASA wind tunnels, the sweep of the wing was able to be increased considerably. It is also worth noting here that the wing in itself is swept, but the thrust brace sit at a slightly different angle. Because of these angles, the thrust brace takes load in multiple different directions, unlike the struts of, for example, a Cessna, which are simply in tension when it flies. Also, the thrust brace in itself is designed to produce some lift, especially at slower speeds. The bracing solves the problem of giving the aircraft both a very high aspect ratio wing and a sweep big enough to allow it to fly at transonic speeds. The aircraft that this full-scale demonstrator aims to emulate is a typical airliner with roughly the same capacity as a Boeing 737 MAX 8, but its wingspan will be much greater. That's because the new wing design will need to have more or less the same area as an existing 737 or an Airbus A320 wing in order to generate a similar amount of lift. And since a higher aspect ratio is needed, the wing has to be both shorter front to back and therefore much longer span wise. And this long span takes us to the next problem with this design. As I explained recently in my video about flying wings, which you can check out up here by the way, airports today are configured with gates for specific aircraft categories. The Boeing 737 and the Airbus A320 both have wingspans just under 36 meters or 118 feet. And that's because this is the maximum allowable width for an aircraft of this particular gate category. Airports typically have much fewer gates adapted for larger sized aircraft and because those aircraft typically handle much more people, the airports charge the airlines much much more to use those. So any new single aisle design that aims to replace what we use today has to stay within those lower footprints in order to be able to use the smaller, cheaper gates. So how do we solve that equation? Much wider wingspan, but the aircraft needs to fit within the same 36 meters wingspan category gates? Well, yes, that means that we need aircraft with folding wings. Of course, this is something that Boeing has already started doing with its new 777X and that they're doing that for the exact same reason, to allow it to park at the gate, sized like for any other Boeing 777, and not have to go up to the gates for the Airbus A380 or the 747. Now, we don't actually know if the demonstrator that NASA and Boeing are preparing will have this folding wing, but obviously this would have to be the case for an operational airliner based on that design, in order for it to uh, be economically viable in today's rules. According to the air current, the uh, TTBW's wing will have a span of 171 feet, about 52 meters. And that would mean that the folding section would need to be at least 16 meters or 52 feet long. With something that long folding upwards, we pilots are probably going to need stronger flashlights when we're doing walkarounds in the darkness. Boeing and NASA wants the TTBW test aircraft to make its first flight around 2028, which actually isn't that far away. And if you think that that sounds unrealistic, it actually isn't. And that's because the test aircraft isn't going to be designed and built from scratch. If the shape of the fuselage of the TTBW models that you have seen seems a bit familiar, well, that's because it is the fuselage of a McDonnell Douglas MD-90. Boeing plans to use the fuselage, tail section, landing gear and several existing systems from a couple of MD-90s that they have in storage. Of course, the aircraft will have to be modified heavily, with a new center section that can support this new unique wing configuration. And one challenge here would be to keep the weight of this new center section in check. Typically, high wing aircraft are heavier than similarly sized low wing designs and that's because in both designs the lower side of the fuselage still needs to take up the forces of the landing gear. And whilst those forces will be taken up by the wing box in a conventional design, with this design there will need to be some kind of weight inducing reinforcements there instead. Plus, there is the question of where the fuel is going to be stored with this new design. Will enough fuel actually be able to be fitted inside this really, really thin wing? That will obviously be solved, but another cool thing is that these wings are going to be made out of composites that will allow it to flex like that of the 787 or the 777X. But given that these ones are even thinner and longer, they will likely flex even more, especially outside of the trusses, and I'm really looking forward to see that. 
And talking about things that you should be looking forward to see, don't miss any of my future videos, make sure you've subscribed. The goal of the Transonic Truss Brace Wing project is to validate an efficiency gain of 9-10% to just on the wing configuration alone. But of course, with the newer propulsion, lighter materials and better system integration in the entire aircraft, the ultimate goal is an overall efficiency improvement of a full 30% over the 737 MAX. And remember, the 737 MAX 8 is already about 14-15% to more efficient than the 737-800 that it's replacing, so we're talking some serious improvements here. As for the engines, well, the CFM RISE engine that we looked at a couple of weeks ago would probably be a strong candidate for the operational version of this design. But the most likely engine choice for the demonstrator will be a version of the Pratt & Whitney PW1000G geared turbofan. This is an engine that powers a lot of Airbus A320neos, but so far no Boeing aircraft. But it would make sense for NASA to nominate Pratt & Whitney for this project because they're already working with NASA on a number of other related projects, including the Hybrid Thermally Efficient Core, or HITECH. That's a project that explores several engine features, like ways to shrink the size of the engine core in order to enable even higher bypass ratios and therefore make the engines even more efficient. So then, are there any controversy in all of this? Well, in the past, Boeing has accused Airbus of having an unfair advantage thanks to funding from several European countries and the European Union. Airbus have always argued that Boeing was getting tax breaks in the state of Washington as a major employer, something that Airbus didn't benefit from in its European sites. All this led to a very ugly and costly trade dispute that lasted nearly two decades before finally quieting down in 2021. But during that time, Airbus also argued that Boeing was getting a lot of financial support for its projects from NASA and the US Department of Defense. So, is there any truth to that? Is the TTBW project simply a way for NASA to fund the design of Boeing's next aircraft? Well, the total amount of NASA's funding for this project is $425 million. NASA will release these funds to Boeing in stages as the program hits certain predetermined milestones. Boeing's press release says that Boeing and its industry partners will bring another $725 million into this project. The wording here isn't very clear about how much of that additional money will actually be Boeing's own and not from the industry partners, but the company states that it has already contributed about $110 million to previous phases of this and other efficiency-related programs. Either way, we need to keep these numbers in some perspective here. $425 million is a huge amount of money, but developing an all-new single-aisle airliner could easily be 10 times as expensive, if even more than that. Plus, the transonic truss brace wing demonstrated will not be an all-new design, as I explained earlier. Beyond this, it's worth remembering that the first A in NASA actually stands for aeronautics, and advancing aeronautics has always been a part of its main role. And NASA's work hasn't been simply about making aircraft more efficient. They've also had a central role in developing wind shear warning systems and clever weather radars that we all take for granted today. Public funding for safety and efficiency is hugely important, which is something that I might come back to in a future video. NASA also have other technology advancing projects that have a lot of relevance for future potential airliners. Those include some new composite that take less time to manufacture, new materials for jet engine cores, and that high-tech project that I already mentioned. Boeing will have to develop the commercial version of this design after examining the performance of the TTBW demonstrator and with its first flight taking place in 2028, the statement of Boeing's CEO that he won't go onto the drawing board before the end of this decade is actually starting to make some sense. So what will Airbus do in response to this project then? Well, Airbus is actually working on a couple of future wing projects that also involve flexible outer wing sections that fold when they're taxiing on the ground. but whether or not they will be able to achieve similarly high aspect ratios without a truss braced wing design will be really interesting to see. Now, check out this video next, which I think you're going to find really interesting, or binge on this playlist. Consider supporting me and my team by sending a super thanks, joining my awesome Patreon crew using the link below, or just get some cool merch. Have an absolutely fantastic day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.